Shift your eyes from the preacher and look at to Jesus. We we haja ya moyo to me kuja kutana na we 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 haja we we haja ya moyo ya moyo wangu mimi kuja to meet with Jesus you can clap better Amen you may take your seats in the presence of Jesus Hallelujah appreciate your neighbor for me tell them it's good to see you here on Friday Amen we appreciate the Lord for the presence of his servants even in the house Pastor Moses Pastor Mark, Pastor Gigi, let's appreciate the Lord for them. Let me also take this opportunity to appreciate our Father in the Spirit and our mom, Pastor Sunta and Apostle David Juma. Let's appreciate them in absentia. And I very well know that they might be watching where they are. We've been dealing with the house of God. The church being the house of God. And yesterday we stepped into a ground where we began to see Jesus as a pattern of the house of God. Important to understand everywhere in the scripture where the house of God has been mentioned. It has never referred to heaven. House of God has never, or the Father's house, has never meant heaven. In the Old Testament, it meant the temple. In the New Testament, after Christ, it means the church. And that's what I'm going just to show us today. We left at Jesus in the temple in John chapter 2 which is an event that happens way after many occurrences that are written in John chapter 2. But I think because the writer of the Gospel of John was more thematic than you know, historical in his context, there was something that John wanted to fight as he was writing the Gospel of John. And that's why John is not part of the synoptic gospels it's a gospel but it's not among the first three which are called synoptic gospels because those ones are more or less historical accounts of the life of christ on earth but john is bound on a journey to prove the divinity of jesus christ actually you find that there are seven miracles in the book of John, you find there are seven declarations of Christ being the Son of God or being God Himself. Because 
there is a trajectory that John is taking to prove that Jesus indeed is a hundred percent God. Glory be to the name of the Lord. The other aspect you find in John is that there are seven parables. Actually, I've given you the summary of the book of John. And if you center your life, uh, your study of John on those three aspects, you grasp a hold of what the book of John is actually about. Seven parables, seven miracles, and seven declarations of the sonship of God or the sonship of Christ uh, to God. That is a summary of the book of John. And these things are summarized as to be written that it might be known that Jesus was not just somebody from Nazareth, you know, who appeared and was a powerful man of God, but indeed he was God in the flesh. And that's why in the book of John we don't have a chronology of his earthly birth. It begins by telling us in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he continues to tell us in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among men, among us, and we beheld the glory. That word dwell is a word tabernacled. Is a word made his house among us. And I want to tell you, since Jesus came on earth, what God had intended in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 to be hosted in human flesh, hallelujah, was redeemed and was restored. As we are going to see, this hosting and indwelling of God on earth through human beings is not to be applied to only one person now. It is to be applied to the corporate body. That when believers come together, they form what is called the house of God. Praise be to the name of the Lord. But in the days of Christ on earth, as we are going to see, when he dwelt here on earth, his main agenda was actually to shift the eyes of people from the temple to himself being the tabernacle of God, as we are going to see. So when you go to John chapter 2, verse 13, we see Jesus getting into the tabernacle. And Jesus wants us to apply ourselves to this conversation. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make, can you note that word? Do not make what? Underline that word. Just underline it, because we are going to find this word in John chapter 14, saying, in my father's house. It is in the same book of John. So whatever Jesus is describing in John chapter 2, according to biblical interpretation, is the same thing he is talking about in John chapter 14. And so let me submit to you that my father's house is not somewhere in heaven after this life. We must understand anywhere the father's house is mentioned, it is talking about God's tabernacle amongst his people. And in those days, it was believed, and the believers, those in faith, believing in God, the creator, those he had chosen, the Jews, they believed that God, was his presence on earth was registered in Jerusalem in the temple. And that's why when Jesus is in his olivet sermon and the disciples call his attention to the temple mount to behold the temple and because they know that that's where God is being hosted. Jesus tells them none of these stones shall remain on one another telling them that this thing is going to shift. God will no longer be dwelling 
where you are focusing my eyes to. Amen. And he goes back. When he is going back and he has cast the fig tree, another emblem of the whole Jewish worship system, glory be to the name of the Lord, he tells them, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be removed and to be cast into the sea. Meaning, this whole system of Jewish worship will be cast into the sea. It will no longer be relevant as the consecrated place for God. In, in Hebrew language, the sea simply means the Gentiles. So, this whole Judaism system will never be applicable again. That's what Jesus is just telling them. If you have faith like a master seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Then your separation, your sanctification as a place where God dwells will be obliterated and Jerusalem will be just like any other city in the world. I don't know whether you understand what you're talking about. It is important for you to begin to understand these things going forward. Are we together? This is the same thing that Jesus is talking about. That who made now, because at that particular time, the context of the people he is speaking about, they understand that the father's house to be the temple. And he is saying, do not make my father's house as a house of merchandise. Other places in the synoptic gospels, you see, is in my father's house. Actually, Jesus calls it my house. It says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Here he is telling them, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. May that sound resonate in our day and age. That the house of God in our day and age will not be a place of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it is written, the zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Then Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple. Mm. So what is Jesus doing? He is transferring the focus of the temple to now the real habitation of God on earth. The word became flesh. God put on flesh. God was housed in a man. He was the one who was given the spirit without measure. And we know who is the spirit. He is God himself. God had restored the order in Genesis. In a man called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he was walking here on earth. And wherever he went, God went. Whatever he said, it is what God was saying. Actually, at one point, you are going to see in John chapter 14, he is so frustrated that one of the disciples is asking him, show us the father. But because the father is in him, the father in him answers the disciple and tells the disciple, you mean you have been all this while with me and you don't know me. It is not actually Jesus speaking. It is the father he has housed in his body speaking to Philip and telling him when you see me you have seen the father glory be to the name of the Lord Jesus because presently on earth God is localized not in a building but he is localized in a man they know it that's why even the Pharisees visit him at night they have realized something has shifted from the temple and it's now mobile with a man from Galilee. We can't doubt things have shifted. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you be set to any religious system around you. You that God will bless with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That the fullness of God as it pertains your assignment and the measure that God has measured for you in the part of the body of Christ will find its full manifestation so that men will not be caught up with that which is a copy. In you, the realities of God will be experienced. 
I'm saying in you the realities of God will be experienced. And this was Jesus, a stumbling block to the religious people. Why? Whatever they could not do, they, they, they could not do, he was able to do. Yet they could not explain how this man from Galilee, this man from Nazareth, is carrying so much potency because they were caught up with God existing in tents made by the hands of man. Glory be to the name of the Lord Jesus. And he says, show us what sign do you show us since you do these things. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking about him. Actually in other texts, he tells the Pharisees, now this, things, this thing you call the father's house is now not the father's house. He tells them, your house has been left desolate. Because it is no longer God's house. Because God's house is here with me. Glory be to the name of the Lord. God has tabernacled in Christ. The fullness of God indwells a man in bodily form. Let me tell you what I realized. Every miracle that Jesus did on earth. Every redemptive cause he championed. Whether the salvation of our sin, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, raising the paralyzed, you know, opening the blind eyes. He was redeeming the house of God. He was cleaning the house of God. You know, he knew that this is the dwelling place of God. But the devil has taken over and he has caused spirits and demonic entities and satanic manifestations to capture the life of a person and the life of the people. And so he was zealous to see the man who the devil had tabernacled with paralysis for 38 years. The Bible says he was moved with pity and he went to the man and told the man, rise up, take up your mat and walk. Let me tell you, every miracle healing freedom we receive from God. It's not just an exercise to showcase his majesty. Yes, that is there. But the major reason as to why Jesus saves us, forgives us, heals us, and redeems us is to make us to be a sanctuary. Glory be to the name of the Lord. If Jesus will deliver you from anything, if Jesus will heal you from any sickness, if Jesus will save you from any sin and oppression and addiction and every force of darkness and give you light of life through his knowledge, I, I pray that you may understand that it is because he wants to indwell in you. Open your heart for him. I'm saying open your heart for him. Give your whole to him. You have lived an excellent successful life. If God lived in you in your tenure on earth. You have achieved the highest of the success ratings of, of your actualization. If indeed God had his work through you. Yeah. Because that's why you are created. Glory be to the name of the Lord. So Jesus tells them destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. This language, Jesus uses it. When you begin to read John chapter 12, John chapter 13, you begin to sense Jesus begins to leave the disciples. He begins to introduce his passion, his death. He begins to tell them, I am leaving you, by the way. I am going. At one time, the Gentiles come and they ask one of the disciples, we want to speak with Jesus. Then Jesus tells them, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, it abideth alone. But if it falls to the ground, it dies. Then it will spring up again and it will be so fruitful, it will bear much fruit, it will have more. This is the same language that Jesus is using about the temple. He is talking about, right now, I'm being hosted, or God is being hosted in one body. But after he goes to the cross and dies, he will rise up and rebuild the temple. Now God or Jesus or the Godhead will not indwell one man on earth. He will now be hosted with a full structure, the full body, you and I included. That's what he is saying. It's the same theory. That he uses when he uses the parable of the seed that grows, goes down and dies and rises up with much harvest. 
Glory be to the name of the Lord. This is the language he's using to describe his passion and his death because he wants to prepare his disciples for what is about to happen. They are about to become the sanctuary of God. Are we together? So let's go to John chapter 14. With that prior knowledge, we can be able now to engage in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So what does Jesus begin to tell them? Let's go to chapter 13, verse 36 first. We begin there because it will help us. What I want you to understand is that you are not just an ordinary gathering. That local church is not just an ordinary gathering. Why God insists you should marry a woman, you should be married by a man in the same faith is because he seeks to tabernacle in our relationships. And we cannot be unequally yoked. Why you must do business with your fellow brethren. Shakura Zaga. Hallelujah. I had something good this week at Rema Fest. We shall be buying our rice. Hallelujah. You know good things are happening in Kenya. <laughs> Don't close your ears. Don't bury your head in the ground. Good things are happening. God really wants to make sure that his house in Kenya is formed for his habitation. It is not that God doesn't want to send us revival. He is waiting to see the formation of the house. Then like on the day of Pentecost, like a mighty rushing wind, the spirit of the Lord will fill the upper room because the temple is now transferred from Herod's temple to somewhere in Solomon Portico. Up there, there is a church there is a temple there is a tabernacle for god and god is now visiting with a cloud of glory to infill his church and the focus changes from the temple of herod it goes to the upper room mm. that's how revivals begin when god migrates from the old system that is dead that is infertile that is barren that is not releasing grace to the community and abodes where his house has been prepared shagayaba in every place you heard of revival revival is nothing else revival is simply god inhabiting earth that's what revival is it's when god comes and dwells among 150 people in Jerusalem. And it is evident he is among them. That's what revival is. Hallelujah. I, you know, even in our schools, we used to have revivals. When a young one man comes hot and fiery for God. And you begin to see the power of God invading the Christian union. That is revival because there is someone who has opened up space for God. Mm hallelujah you know don't be troubled when you see a church that has come in town and people are gathering people know where god is because they are looking for him they are looking for him so when he tabernacles in a ministry they will go there i'm telling you the truth may the lord tabernacle in our lives hallelujah may the lord tabernacle in our lives even in our businesses hallelujah you will not lose clients you will receive something from heaven that when people come to your business they feel they have been ministered to by god not a man not a business not commodities and products or services or offered but that place has become a sanctuary for the lord Glory be to the name of the Lord. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Reason being, Jesus was going to die. And the price of our salvation cannot be paid by Peter. It has to be paid by Christ alone. Because where he is going, he's, it's where he wants to bring us to. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life. And you know the trouble they had there with his, with his disciple Peter. But let's go now to verse 14. He tells them, even though I am going and you not see me, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he quotes it. Verse 2, let's read together. In my, 
Let's read together. First John 14, 2. John 14, 2. Let's read together. I want to go. In my father's house are many mansions. Now, that word is derived from the Latin vulgate. Mansion. That's Latin. Glory be to the name of the Lord. The original is what we find in NIV. It's not actually mansion. Is Let's go to NIV. You know, the, the New Testament was written in two versions. There's a Greek Septuagint, and then it was translated to the Latin Vulgate, and then later now to English. Now, when you see that mansion, is the one that comes from the Latin Vulgate. But this is the sense. The sense is that in my father's house, there are many compartments. There are many rooms. You know, when you talk about mansions in a house, you don't understand. Because for you and your architecture, mansions, <laughs> mansions, a mansion is a house by itself. Glory be to the name of the Lord. But this one brings a better understanding. Actually, it simply means dwellings. There are many dwellings. The, 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 the right Greek word there, it simply means there are many dwellings, there are many rooms. And so Jesus is telling them, in me, because I am now the Father's house. There are many rooms. There are many dwellings in me. But you can't see it right now. When you go to continue reading there, it says, you can't see it right now. He says, I would have told, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What is Jesus telling them? Right now, the Father indwells me in bodily form. And I'm only one. But I would want the Father to be indwelled in many of us. So I will go, and when I go, I will come in another form. Kayabaza. That now will not be with you, but will be in you. Hallelujah. And the moment I am in you, then you and I can be at the same place. What is the same place? You and I are making the Father's house. And you are a room. I am a room. You are a room. We are, we are inhabited by God. Hallelujah. That's what saying. I will prepare a place for you. That word place for you is not I will prepare a kamwanya for you. No, it simply means I will make you to have a placement like I am placed. I am placed as a son. I am positioned as a son. I am positioned as a son of God. I will come and also make you to be positioned as a son of God. I will make you to be one of the living stones as you come to me. The living stone, according to First Peter chapter 2. Let's go there. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Verse number 3. Coming to Jesus. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 2, verse 3. Hallelujah. Verse 4. Verse 4. Verse 4. Hallelujah. Let's read together. I want to go. Coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by god and precious verse 5 hallelujah you also as living stones now he's telling them jesus or god is not dwelling in temples made by the hands of men the stones are now living things are living beings as god intended previously what are we being built up to we are being built up into a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up sacrifice spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ but for that transaction to be actualized he must die so that he comes in another form so that you and i can be placed as sons also can be placed as living stones that are forming the room that's why the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. I inhabit their union. I inhabit their coming together. Are we together? 
Are you understanding? So they continue to ask Jesus questions. And Jesus begins to explain to them how the Father is in them. And he begins to show them, if you don't believe it by the mere speakings of my word, just believe by the works that you begin to see. Glory be to the name of the Lord. And verse 15 he says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. You see what he is doing? And he's saying, because it neither sees him, nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. This is an interplay of the Trinity. You know, Jesus must have been a serious orator. A serious orator. With all the parables that he was giving, and with all the, the mixture of the concepts. You know, he would mix concepts. This must have been the spirit of God, speaking through the man. He, he would make a good mosaic of his representation of the Trinity. He is saying the spirit who is coming in you is already dwelling with you. <laughs> How is he dwelling with you? Because that spirit is housed in me. Are we together? Say so he dwells with you and now will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Mm. I will come to you. Verse 15 now begins the narrative of the house of God shifting from the temple. To coming to a man. Let's read this. Verse 19. A little while longer. And the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live. What will happen to you? You will live also. At that day. You will know that I am in my father. And you in me. And I in you. Are you getting the language? That this house is a spiritual house. Is not brick and mortar. There is no way this house can have another house in it and this house also in the house. This is spiritual language. Hallelujah. That God is tabernacled in us, yet we are tabernacled in him. He is saying the transaction has shifted back to the Garden of Aden where Adam would be in the presence of the Lord at the cool of day. Yet the spirit of God was indwelling in Adam. So that whatever Adam named an animal, God had named that animal. God is coming back to his own field. God is coming back to his own house. That transaction was what Christ was going to pay the price for at the cross. Aye. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, God will be housed only in one man walking on earth. But when it falls to the ground and dies, many more rooms in the Father's house will show up. I came to declare in the name of Jesus Christ. You are a room in the Father's house. Come on, hold your neighbor. Tell them you are a room. You are a room. Get to another person. Hold their hands and tell them you and I are rooms. Hallelujah. You know what? The, the problem with a spiritual house, it is not static. It is a mobile room. So let me show you how it operates. Come here, my friend David. Let me have, uh, can I use you, my, my brother? Just come here. It's not a mobile room. And that's why the word mansions was used by the Latin Vulgate. Latin Vulgate, the word mansion means an inn you meet along the way. You see the inns that you go, probably you're going all the way to Eldoret. You stop at Eldoret, you get into a and b that's a house. Are you understanding? So a spiritual house is not static. Are we together? Now, this man is in his house. He is a, probably he is alone. Uh, and probably you're married? Yes, he is married. So probably he is alone. Let's take that he is alone. He is not married. Uh, and it's not the case. We are just using it as a teaching aid. He is alone. While he is in his house, him alone, he is a dwelling place of God. In that location. In that locality. In that house. Hallelujah. But he moves to the office. He meets this gentleman. They hold hands together and pray. The house has shifted. It has taken another room. A moving house. A moving house. So anything God wants to do in the office, these two believers are the ones that God will come and headquarter in their prayer. 
headquarter in their relationship, headquarter in their fellowship. Oh my God, he is the head of the church, the fullness of him who fills all things, all in all, and he has set all things on his feet for the sake of the church. Let me tell you, sister, if something is bothering you, find a fellow believer, establish a community of believers. All of a sudden, anything that was on top of you will come below you. Because, because everything has been set under him. So when you find the body and you begin to fellowship, whatever was over you, because of the function of the manifestation of the body of Christ, whatever is over you comes under you. That's why church gatherings cannot be taken lightly. This is where we bring the high things down by one song, by one corporate prayer. Anything that has been lifted above the knowledge of God submits why the body has formed. And when the body of Christ forms on earth, any exalted thing must come down because that's the position of everything. Glory be to the name of the Lord. But these brethren have to move quickly and go for a fellowship. So they run. You can go back to your seats. And when they go back for the fellowship the house moves and takes and mutates and takes another form that's why the bible says in my father's house there are many rooms there are many mansions there are many moving habitations ah, yeah, 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 yeah. you cannot constrict the house of god to jerusalem in one place in one location when one believer meets another believer in the marketplace and things are not going on well they can at that particular time invoke the presence of god in that environment and shut the gates of hell for i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail how does god build his church it is this moving living stones the good thing about living stones is that they are not constrained in a structure today you'll meet they look like a hexagon building tomorrow they are looking like a tower the next day they are looking like a cager you know because it's a living stone you cannot cement living yeah 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 you cannot cement living souls and build a monument. That's why any time the church tries to reduce the move of God to a monument, God comes and shakes it and sends Stephen to be persecuted and sends Philip to Samaria, my God, and scatters abroad his house because another house must form somewhere. Another house must form somewhere. Never institutionalize the church of god it's not an institution no 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 this is an organism not just an organization it's an organism it's a living thing that's how we say it in my mother tongue the church is like nikikitu is a is a, is a thing is a, a living thing glory be to the name of the lord i in you and you in me verse 21 let's finish this thing he who has my commandments and keep them it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him. And I will manifest myself to him. Actually the right rendering there is that I will manifest myself through him. Why? He has become my house. But let's go to verse 23. Let's just jump because Judas, not Iscariot, another one. <coughs> asks a question. How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Now the answer of what was a question in John chapter 14 verse 1 is answered here in 23. Jesus says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and will come to him and make our home. Oh, Make our home with him. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, don't procrastinate your experience of the Father's house to behold the Jordan. Ah, may you begin operating as the house of God. When the Holy Ghost comes upon us, he makes us the house of God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, let's go there, I think it's 2 Corinthians. We can read that very quickly and then I will just quickly give the small points that I have with me. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's begin from verse number 13. What does it say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to, you to know that you are indwelt with the Holy Ghost. And I want you to seek more of the infilling of the Spirit of God. You are legitimate when you ask to house God. That your marriage should be a house of God. It should be holy ground. That your business, whatever pertains your life, if the shadow of a man could be quickened to be a habitation for God, if the sweat and the DNA of a man when he is preaching in Ephesus would be taken to people, it's not, it's not the sweat of Paul that was healing people when garments were taken. Are we together? No, it's not the sweat of Paul. It is God who was in the sweat. Yeah. I, I, I think you have seen ministers of the gospel full of their anointing and casting their coats and people are hit by the power of God. It's the fragrance of the man because the scripture must be made evident, spreading the aroma of Christ. They themselves, their aroma alone is filled with God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When you see, Pastor Moses, somebody leading worship and peace, calmness, tranquility, healing, inner healing of the soul, liberation has come. It's, not, it's nothing else. It's because that person has decided to be a host of God. So God is ministering through them. When you see a preacher ministering and people are healed, people are receiving understanding and revelation and light is dawning to them, it's because the Holy Ghost has taken over his body. Verse 14. Second Corinthians verse 14. Oh, let's read together. I want to go. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is why you cannot marry a non-believer. This is why even if you want to evangelize to him inside the marriage, it can't work. You are messing the habitation of God. When you read the book, the Old Testament, and you begin to realize how God was very specific about intermarriages. Because he was residing amongst his people, Israel. He did not want anything to defile that. Because that is a, their seed was to come and manifest him in the flesh. Are we together? For what fellowship has righteousness? With what? With lawlessness. And what communion has light with what? With darkness. Verse 15. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Continue verse 16. Oh, glory be to the name of the Lord. And what agreement has the temple of God? Who is the temple of God? Say us. What agreement has the temple of God? You know, sometimes when you say the temple of God, people immediately picture Kenya cinema. Uh -uh. Temple of God is you. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the... Let's read together. You are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Ooh, where is God walking? Where is God moving? I know Paul. In Acts 17, says in him we move, in him we live, in him we have our being. But he fathers the conversation. That we are not only moving and having our being in him, but he is also moving and having our being in us. Listen to me. The privilege you have as a believer is that you are not only contained in the omnipresence of God.